good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you again for tuning in for another session of EI Live K-12 uh, for students uh, and educators. My name is Cassie, um, and I oversee educational and outreach activities at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Uh, so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, the Earth Institute is um, a research uh, center that's a part of Columbia University. Um, our core mission is to foster a greater understanding of the science behind climate change and sustainability and what we as global citizens can do. Um, we have quite an interdisciplinary uh, roster of faculty and researchers um, that uh, collaborate across many different departments uh, and disciplines at Columbia. Um, experts that make up the Earth Institute include uh, business and policy experts, uh, economists, specialists in public health uh, and law, and of course, uh, geoscientists and earth and environmental scientists. Um, so what we're hoping to do with these EI Live K-12 sessions is to introduce you to some of that amazing work that our researchers and our faculty are, in, are engaged in and to hear directly from them and have an opportunity to ask questions that you've always been wanting to ask. We're going to be having these sessions until the end of June. So uh, on a weekly basis, and if you'd like any information about the upcoming sessions, please don't hesitate to contact me directly after the session. Today, we're super, super lucky to have Johnny Kingslake with us from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is the largest research center that is part of the Earth Institute. And Johnny is a glaciologist. So he's going to be speaking to us about ice and how ice actually flows and acts like a blanket on the Earth's surface. Um, so Johnny's gonna do his presentation and we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes or so at the end for uh, q and If you do have questions that come up throughout the uh, presentation, feel free to use the Q&A box. We'll definitely keep an eye on that and make sure that we address as many questions as we can. We're also going to have a colleague from uh, NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies uh, to join us a little bit later on as well after Johnny's done um, to share some NASA resources that are available um, on this particular topic. So without further ado, um, Johnny, why don't you get us started? Thanks, Cassie. That's great. I wanted to say thank you for organizing these events because I think they're really great. And it's a way of us to, a way of us allowing us to help uh, spread our science and spread education around a, a, a wide group of people. And Cassie was just telling me how the YouTube channel where these things are recorded are actually, it's actually pretty well attended and the viewing figures there are really, really high too. So you can always tell your friends about this. It's being recorded and they can watch it afterwards. Right, so yeah, I'm a glaciologist and I apply the basic physics of um, the basic physics to glaciers and ice sheets and try to understand how they behave. And my background is actually in physics. I did an undergraduate degree in physics, but I went into glaciology because it seemed like it, it supplied all these opportunities to apply the, that knowledge to a really fascinating system or set of systems, which we like, we, we talk about systems in earth science quite often. And this system is glaciers and ice sheets. So I'm in the um, I'm in Le Mans Dirty Earth Observatory. I'm in the Earth and Environmental Science Department, and I'm a system professor there. And I have a kind of small research group who all we all study processes which control how ice sheets operate. Today, I wanted to do a, something a little bit different than what I've done in the past, where in the past I've talked about my science more closely. This time around, I want to go into a little bit more depth with some actual equations. I'm actually going to include some equations and, and, and write down some derivations of some equations. And like in the warning said in the description of the, of the class, this is a little bit more advanced, but really, it, you know, don't let that put you off. And I chose this topic, the, the Earth's blanket in a way to, um, because it provides me an opportunity to demonstrate how some really simple physics, which you will have covered in high school uh, by now, maybe, can actually provide insight into something quite complicated like an ice sheet. So we're gonna talk about Antarctica, this picture on the left is Antarctica, talk about ice cores, and we're gonna talk about the, the fact that water exists at the base of the ice sheets. And I'm gonna talk about how ice cores and, and water at the base of the ice sheets are linked. But first, I'm going to start with a curve, which I hope many of you have already seen, this graph, it's called the Keeling curve. And it, it's a time series, so time is along the 
horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is the proportion of carbon dioxide in the air in parts per million. And as we all know, that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is, is increasing with, also, with many detrimental effects for extreme weather and droughts and sea level rise. Now, the reason I bring it up here, because what we have here is a snapshot in a way. If you look at the left, imagine we only had data from 2016 through to present. You would, you know, you'd be sure to see that this graph is, is increasing from left to right. That curve is on the up, it's increasing over time. But who's to say whether that's part of some natural fluctuation, which is just gonna go back down again. Maybe the whole thing is oscillating up and down in a random kind of way. We would never know just by looking at this little snapshot on the left. But luckily they started recording this going up to the top of a mountain in Hawaii back in the 50s or in the late 50s, 1958. So we can zoom out to the decadal time scale, and that's what's shown on the left. We can see that it's not part of some decadal oscillation, meaning an oscillation which goes up and down like roughly every 10 years. Actually, it's part of a longer term trend. Carbon dioxide is increasing over time, over you know, a human lifetime time scale, time scale. Okay, that's good. But we still don't know really, because the climate could oscillate in all sorts of timescales. It could go up and down. And maybe this is just a longer term trend, which might turn back round again. What we need to do is zoom out further. And to do that, we use ice cores. So ice cores are these long cylindrical um, cylinders of ice, which are extracted from really thick ice sheets and glaciers. And they, they store valuable information about how the climate has changed over much, much longer timescales. So here's a record from, a, from an ice core going back 800,000 years rather than just a few decades. And it shows carbon dioxide again in the same parts per million units. And what you see is there are oscillations. It definitely is going up and down. And, and there's many, many different um, timescales of oscillation here. Some of them up, go up and down every 100,000 years. Sometimes they go up and down a few, every few thousand years. And it certainly, and certainly changes over time. But what we can see, once we've put the current level of CO2 in the atmosphere into context with a much, much longer time scale, you can see that, and it's shown here, you can see that it's actually much, much higher than it has been for the last 800,000 years. I'm just uh, quickly looking at the Q&A. Do you take data out from, the mo um, from that mountain, because <laughs> which I can't pronounce, because it's out in the middle of nowhere, relative content. Yes, I think that is the reason they started doing it there, because they had that, that opportunity to reach relatively untouched atmosphere. They're trying to sample a kind of representative sample of atmosphere. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, George Murray. So putting this into context with a much, much longer time scale really shows us something important. It shows that this isn't just a normal oscillation uh, which which will which will go back down again over time. It's actually very um, abnormal on the time scale of hundreds of thousands of years. Now, the only reason we could do this is because of these things called ice cores, and I'm going to talk about those. So, first of all, to understand ice cores, you need to understand what ice sheets are, and hopefully, people have come across this idea before. But in these locations where the the, the climate is cold and snow falls in the winter but doesn't melt in the summer, that snow just builds up and up and up and becomes thick layers of ice that we call ice sheets. We've got two, we've got one in Greenland up here in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and we've got a larger one down in the Southern Hemisphere called Antar Antarctica. Uh, I've studied both of these ice sheets and you know they're full of fascinating processes. And I've just picked out one today, which is this blanketing effect, which, which warms up the surface of the earth, which I'll get to. So ice cores, these big cylinders of ice, hundreds or thousands of meters long, they're drilled through these ice sheets, and many, many of them have been drilled through in Antarctica. And here's a, here's a probably out of date map of where all of those ice cores are. Um, here's a more complete record from one of those. Just to say, ice cores are really important for putting things in context. Even better, they can record more than just CO2. They can also give us an indication of what the temperature was back in the past. And this is um, a record showing the CO2 again in blue over to how that oscillates up and, up and down in time. But it really shows even more importantly how that affects the temperature or at least how temperature and CO2 seem to be in lockstep almost on this timescale. 
So here's a particularly famous ice core from, from a place called Vostok in the middle of Antarctica, just here. Okay, so where do you, how do you decide where to drill these ice cores? This is a big challenge, right? It's a very expensive thing to do. What you want to do is make sure that you're drilling in a place that's going to give you a really long record, ideally going back hundreds of thousands of years. And now there is a big international effort to try and find a place where you could drill into, into ice, which is a million years old. Now that's really important because it's, uh, there are interesting changes in the climate that has happened that have happened over the last million years that we currently do not have a very uh, high resolution record of. So getting that older ice would be really fantastic. Okay, so generally people try to drill these ice cores in a place in the middle of the ice sheet. This is a big cartoon ice sheet, this blue thing. It looks like a big blob of material and, it, and that's what it is. It's a big blob of uh, viscous material actually. It's flowing viscously like a, like a syrup poured into a table. And that's what happens with ice. When it gets into a uh, large enough volume, it starts to flow. And these arrows show the, the direction in which it's flowing. Now, the ice core site in this cartoon is right at the summit of this ice sheet. There's two reasons for that. One is because it's the thickest location. So you might hope that you might get the most or the longest time scale record from there. And the other thing is that it's not moving sideways, actually. The ice is flowing off in that direction on the left and off in that direction on the right. But in the middle, it's theoretically very... Uh, stationary. So what do you do? You uh, deploy some instrumentation. This is a quite a small scale drilling rig, this picture shows, uh, but there are larger ones. And you extract these cylinders of ice shown on the right. And if in a zoom in of, of, of the layers you can pick up in these ice cores is shown on the, at the bottom. And these arrows indicate annual layers. So annual, but they, each one of these is about a year apart in terms of accumulation. And then they analyze these in lots of detail to, to, to measure how much CO2 is in the little air bubbles and various other things to try and understand climate and, and, and produce those figures, those graphs I was just showing. But what I'm interested in is how do you decide where to drill them? I already said thickness is a good indicator. You might want to go to the places which are most thick. Well, Antarctica is very thick. It's 2.5 miles thick, an un unimaginably large volume of ice. And uh, a nice figure here is shown uh, of the Greenland ice sheet. And this is a little bit like a, an MRI scan through the ice and, and it shows a cross section through the ice showing how it's thicker in the middle and thinner at the sides. So first of all, you might think, okay, definitely gonna drill in the middle because that's where it's thickest. Let me check this Q and A again. So Charles is asking about the age of dinosaurs from the ice cores. Uh, yes, well, that's a great question. <laughs> Let me uh, not jump into saying yes. Actually, the age of dinosaurs ended 65 million years ago. So unfortunately, even though these ice sheets record a really detailed record of the climate, they don't go back that far. It's a great, great point because it really indicates that wouldn't it be great if you could get back further? We can only go back 800,000 years at the moment. It would be great to go back million, a million years or even better, 65 million years. But I think that might be beyond reach, but they might be able to get to a million years. So that's the aim at the moment to try and get to that point. And to do that, they need to target the right spot. Now I'm going to talk about a surprising fact is that even though the surface of the surface of the ice sheets are very cool, there's only, you know, the temperature is, is very low. It's, uh, you know, you're talking much lower than melting point. So at the top of the green and ice sheet, the average annual air temperature is probably minus 20 C or probably you're talking negative Fahrenheit values. So much colder than you would expect to see any meltwater. None of that snow should be melting. But the surprising thing is at the base of the ice sheets, underneath where the ice touches the rock, the ice can be much, much warmer than at the surface. And you see evidence of meltwater at the bottom. This little, let me just see if I can get this video working for you. Um, no. One second. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, we're running now. Perfect. Amazingly, if you look at the surface of the ice sheet, you see little areas going up and down. You can measure this with satellites or you can go there with, a, with an instrument to measure the surface going up and down. And this cartoon is trying to show what people think is causing that. 
this is a little cross section through the ice and they, these are these little pockets of water down there and they fill up and drain and the surface of the ice responds to this. This is something we're researching at Lamont right now actually. And the surface of ice responds to this and goes up and down. And so people do this over large areas and they can reconstruct what's going on down at depth. And what's going on is there's a whole drainage system down there, a whole river network, connect, lakes connected by rivers feeding water to, into each other. So this is, should be really surprising to people. Like the poles are very cold, right? The, the surface temperature is way colder over vast, the vast majority of Antarctica or Greenland for any melting to happen. Yet at depth, it's warm enough for these river systems to occur, apparently, given these observations. Now, another thing, just to really convince you that at the base of ice sheets, there are river systems. You can go to Canada to today and look at the, what we call geomorphology, so the shape of the land, and see evidence of past you know, extensive rivers flowing along at the base of the ice sheet because Canada and some parts of the US used to be covered by an ice sheet 20,000 years ago when the climate was much colder. The climate was much colder and there was no chance of any um, water being around at the surface of the ice because the, the air temperature was way too low. Yet at the base of the ice sheet where it touches the rock, there's water um, uh, moving around all the time. So this is something I want to explain to you. Now I'm going to take you off into a different, um, approach here, rather than looking at these figures, I'm going to actually start try to demonstrate to you the way in which we try to tackle these things. Just to demonstrate to all the people in there who are currently doing their high school physics classes, that simple physics applied to these systems, the, the, these considerations can really help you understand things. I want to demonstrate to you how the base of the ice sheet might be warmer than the surface. And in fact, it certainly is. Okay, let me start drawing a little cartoon here. Hopefully you can see my little cartoon I'm drawing. Shout out if you can't. Cool, so I've got, this is the surface of the ice. Oops, I'll use a different color for that. This is the surface of the ice. And then this is the base of the ice. It's a little cartoon. Um, we're gonna say this, the thickness of the ice is H thick. And we're gonna say that the temperature at the surface of the ice the temperature at the surface is going to be given by this ts now the temperature at the base the one which we don't know and we're going to hope to try and derive an equation describing we're going to say that's the temperature at the base is tb for base Okay, just to make this nice and clear, I'll draw a little picture of a sun here. This is the surface. And then this underneath is the ground, the rock. So let's just draw that in so no one's confused. This is ice and this is air. Now, this is something which if you've done geosciences or something at high school, you might be familiar with, but if not, you may not be. But there's constantly energy, heats coming up from the interior of the earth. That people call this geothermal heating or geothermal heat flux. And there's this energy is left over from when the earth formed. It was very warm initially, and that energy has not been dissipated yet. And it's also down to radioactive decay in the crust. But, not, but, but either, in, any, in either case, it's called geothermal heating. So that's going to be our source of energy, which warms up the base and of the ice and allows it to act like a bit of a blanket. Okay. Now this is where the physics comes in. This is a, this is the physics. Okay, so this is called so, this is something called Fourier's law. Oh, I can't write clearly. Law of heat conduction. Well, I'm going to write down now. This is where all the physics comes in. So what this says is Q, which is the heat flux flowing through a thing, in our case the ice sheet, is equal to the thermal conductivity or negative of the thermal conductivity times by the change in the temperature across a distance delta z so 
this is the heat flux, or I shouldn't say heat flow, how quickly heat is flowing through a material. This is the thermal conductivity, which is just a constant. And it's just a property of the material. So ice has a higher thermal conductivity than copper. And both of those have a lower thermal conductivity than expanded polystyrene or cardboard or something like that. And then this is a change in temperature. And then over a distance, delta Z. This is the physics. So how do we apply this to this system, right? This is the kind of thing we're always working on in, in, our, in our science. We have this physical law and we want to apply it to ice sheets. All right, so one thing I'm gonna do is use this symbol G for the geothermal heating. That's how much heat is coming up every second. Now, if the system has arrived in a, in a state that nothing is changing anymore, meaning that nothing, no, nothing's heating up, cooling down, basically that means that the heat flow Q everywhere in the ice is equal to the geothermal heating. That's a quite a subtle thing, which actually may not be clear to everybody. So imagine that every, like the heat coming up, the heat, the heat coming up here to the base of the ice has to equal the same amount of heat going through this layer and this layer and this layer and this layer all the way through to the top. So what they're saying is, what's this saying is Q is actually equal to G everywhere. So I can write that down. I can do G is equal to Q and that is equal to this thing. So now the final, there's a couple more things I can say. Well, the difference in the temperatures, this delta T, the difference in the temperature is just gonna be the temperature at the surface minus the temperature at the base. And the difference in the, uh, the, the, the distance delta Z is just equal to the thickness of the ice. So I can plug both of these things back into this equation. So bear with me. We plug these things both back into this equation. Then we get this thing. G is equal to minus K times by TS. Take away TB divided by the thickness. So all I've done is applied our physics to our system. Now I'm just going to do some, uh, some algebra and move th some things around until we have an equation for our temperature at the base, because that's the thing we're interested in. That's the thing I want to tell you and show you must be warm. I've actually got a great question here from Emma. Is terrain friction a factor in the melting? Absolutely, yes. And I've completely ignored that. If we really wanted to do it in, in detail, there would be an extra thing in here, which is, which is friction. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's too complicated for now. But thanks for that good question. OK, so now I'm going to do multiply both sides of this by H. So that's GH. Divide it by K, and that leaves me with, uh, and, then, and then, then take that minus sign over to the other side, and that's equal to TS minus TB. Then I'm gonna move TB over to the left-hand side, and this thing on the left over to the right-hand side, and that becomes, there we go, GH over K. Okay, now, a couple of things. You don't want to just, this is our equation. This is our final result in a way, but you don't want to leave it there. You want to immediately try and analyze this a little bit. This is what we do every, every day. So one thing is you can immediately say, so geothermal heat flux is a positive number. H is a positive number and K is a positive number. That means all of this is positive. That means no matter what's going on, TB at the base, the temperature at the base is always going to be more than the temperature at the surface. This is basically going back to the title of the talk. Ice sheets are acting like a blanket. So whatever surface temperature it is, it's always going to be warmer down at the base because of this blanketing effect, this insulating effect of having a K, having a having a uh, having a insulating effect. What else can we say? Well, imagine that uh, the thermal conductivity was actually very very high. It was more like copper than it was an actual blanket. It was very, heat found it very easy to move through the ice. Well, if K was very big, that would be, this would be something divided by a very big number and it would get very small. 
and this, the temperature at the base would actually equal the temperature at the surface, or it would, it, would, it would approach it. And the temperature would be the same throughout the thickness. What else can we say? Well, one final thing to say is that where, oh yeah, so what if there was no geothermal heat flux? What if actually all that heat had dissipated from the interior of the earth and, and all that radioactivity had stopped? Well, again, the base, the temperature at the base would be equal to the temperature at the surface. And then one final thing to say is that the, as the temperature at the base increases with the thickness, the thicker it is, the more insulating it is. The thicker, to, the thicker your comforter is on your bed, the warmer you are. And so that's actually the key point. Let's go back out of this uh, share here and I'll go back to my slides and I'll finish with, and I'll begin to finish my main point here that after going through those equations, can you see my slides again? Hopefully you can. Yep, you're good. Thanks, Cassie. So this is our equation. And now we've made the point here that the bigger H is, the thicker the ice is, the warmer the bed, the base is. Now, just to take the analogy a little bit further, imagine you're wearing a really, really thick blanket and you get so thick enough that you actually begin to sweat. <laughs> now this, the analogy isn't quite perfect because the sweat in our case is actually the base of the ice sheet melting. What happens if you get warm enough? You get, what happens if you get up to the melting point? Well, you start melting the ice off the base. Now that, you know, maybe that's fine, but if you want to drill a nice long ice core with a really, really long record, if you start getting melting at the base, you're losing the oldest part of the record, the stuff which is right at the bottom, which was laid down a million years ago or 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were around. That stuff starts melting away and your record gets lost. So this, is a, this isn't just an academic example. This is a real example of people trying to find million year old ice and really having to think carefully about this. You want to go to thick places because that's where the longest records are. But if you go too thick, you get to a point where the ice starts melting. So what does this look like in, in an academic paper? Well, this is the version of our equation in this particular paper. Now, believe it or not, you could, um, oops. So if you cross that out, cross that out and cross that out, which is by making some assumptions, you get back to what we basically just derived, believe it or not. But in any case, you can, you can end up, you can look at the ice sheet and decide where, where, what temperature do we think it is at the base of the ice sheet everywhere. And here's a map of what these people uh, decided. And what you need to do is target places which is not melting today, but they're still extra thick to try it. So there's that compromise, not too thick, but thick enough to try and get this million year old ice. So just to uh, finish off then, actually there's this other whole area of glaciology which I didn't touch upon today is that the ice is actually flowing under its own weight. I mentioned it briefly, but it's flowing like a viscous fluid. And this diagram shows that the, the, these little blue, uh, little blue streaks are showing the direction in which the ice is flowing and the colors show the speed. And what's going on is ice is flowing from the middle out towards the edges. And that's fundamentally important to everything. And I didn't include that in our simple model, but these people did, and it's this little V here. So actually, even in our simple case about heat flow, ice flow is all important. And really this is what our research group spends all our time thinking about is how ice flows and how it affects all these things. So hopefully I've persuaded you that Simple physics can provide some insights. Thanks for sitting through my equation derivation. And I can tell you that is very much like the class I teach at undergraduate level and graduate level on this topic. So if you ever end up in my classes like this, this is what it will be like, me deriving equations and talking about them in depth. So we do it all the time. The take home points, ice sheets store valuable information about our climate. To, to extract this information, we need to understand the ice sheet. In our case, in our particular case, it was we need to understand where and what controls the temperature. So where is below the melting point and what controls this? So as geoscientists, we're always applying physics, chemistry, and mathematics to, to well, in my case, the ice sheets, but it, broadly across Le Mans, all sorts of different parts of the Earth system. And yeah, my research at Le Mans and EI is all about how, it, all about understanding how the ice flows. And actually, 
which I didn't mention is also how water flows through the system too, because like, like I mentioned, there's, there's water at the base and in some places there's water on the surface too. And I hope, like I said, hopefully I persuade you that applying simple physics can provide insight and explain some observations. And then in, in this case, hopefully it explains to you why there can be water at the base of the ice sheets, even though the surface is very, very cold. It's because the ice sheet is insulating the surface of the earth. So thanks very much. That's, that's, that's everything. Hey, great. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, so what I'm going to do now, so Johnny, there are some questions in, oh, yeah. uh, in the Q&A box, but I'm going to um, turn it over to uh, Rosalba from NASA GIS just for a couple of minutes while she shares some slides. Johnny, if you want to take a crack at any of those questions, they're still coming in quickly. So if you want to, you could type your answers in the Q&A box or we can come back to them shortly after uh, Rosalba's done as well. So Rosalba, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Kathy. Can you hear me? You're good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to share my screen. It always takes some time for me to be able to do that in one second. Zoom is difficult for my machine. Um, I hope you can see my slides now. We can see it. Thank you. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. My name is Rosalva. I help support NASA's Office of STEM Engagement at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies here in New York City. And um, so, yeah, thank you, Cassie, for the opportunity to share about some. NASA resources to keep learning about the glaciers. Um, so I'm going to actually put in the chat some links. Um, hope you can see that. My screen is very weird. Um, so yeah, I am going to share with you about three NASA resources, the Global Ice Viewer, Images of Change, and the Scientific Visualization Studio. But I also put in the chat the link to the IceSat2 mission, um, which is very relevant to this topic. So that stands for Ice Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite 2. And so that's a mission that was launched in 2018 and will help us learn more about how the warming climate is affecting the cryosphere. But yeah, so now I want to share about these resources. So we have the Global Ice Viewer that is on the um, NASA Climate website. And so here you can visualize how climate change has affected glaciers the ice and continental ice sheet worldwide. So you can go by topic and look at those visuals. The next resource is Images of Change. This is a pretty, pretty cool web page. So you can see a gallery of images that compare, you know, how things looked um, sometimes centuries ago, sometimes just days ago, and how they look now. And so it has different ways in which you can visualize those images. You can, there's like a slide bar. You can just slide left to right to see the dramatic change that has taken place in many locations around the world. The link that I sent you, that specific link, is for you to look at the Helham Glacier Melt in Greenland. But there are many, many other images of change that you can explore. And Third, um, there's also on the link that I sent you, um, there is a 360 video where you can pretty much like fly above Alaskan glaciers. I don't know if it's going to, um, while I talk, kind of move for you to take a look at, um, at this video, but you have the link. And so this visualization studio works closely with scientists to create visuals and animations and images um, in order to promote a greater understanding of Earth and space science. So this is just an example, the, the one that I sent you on this link, but there are tons of visuals and animations and you can download them 
for free. So it's a very, very good resource for you to explore. And that's it. That's what I have. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. Um, so Johnny, I'm gonna turn it back to you. If you wanna tackle, I know you've answered a few, but if you wanna answer some of these um, uh, live, that would be that would be great too. Absolutely. Uh, good questions. Yeah, they are good questions. I can't keep up with them. How, <laughs> how, how much the ice impact Flow, impact the ice for it to build up where the ice is flowing from. Well, uh, Anissa is asking about the ice flow and how it impacts like the shape, I guess, of the ice sheet and where, it, where it's flowing from. Well, it's really fundamental to it. So the ice is, the snow is, the way that the ice sheet operates really is a balance between snow falling, which tries to grow the ice sheet, and then uh, icebergs carving off the side and melting at the bottom and melting at the top, at the edges. So that's removing ice. But the way that the ice gets from that cool, uh, cold central area out to the warmer area where it can, you know, break off into the ocean, that's all ice flow, which controls that. So it is fundamental in, in explaining that. How do you date the different layers if there is viscous flow and mixing of different eras of ice sheets? Yeah, great question. Dating is a big problem and the flow affects that pretty significantly. Luckily, when it is a very viscous flow. So if you ever thought about turbulent flow versus viscous flow, turbulent flow is the kind of flow which you get in your um, shower head or a fast river. And, the, and in that case, all the, all the material is mixing. In our case, you're very, it's very, very viscous and it's not really mixing in the sense of layers being tumbled over each other. You still get some complication. And in some cases you can get overturning but for the most part, especially where they draw ice cores, the layers are very well behaved and they just go down together and relatively flat. And it's all about trying to work out how fast they go down. That's true. But luckily they're not mixed up. Otherwise it really would ruin the record and you would have drilled in the wrong place. If that happens, you would have made that mistake. Mm. What can I work? Charles wanted to, would be interested to hear about any trips you've taken to Antarctica to study the ice cores. Well, I have I have studied I have studied Antarctica and I've spent um, months in Antarctica uh, camping out and on the surface in a little tent and and taking measurements which later on helped to plan where they wanted to drill an ice core. So we weren't actually going there to study the ice cores, but we did contribute to this because we were lucky enough to go somewhere, which. Uh, ended up being a good place for someone to drill an ice core. And I was actually sending them from the tent in Antarctica. I was sending them out the little pictures that we got from our uh, little bits of data, which we got from our instruments back to headquarters so that they could plan their ice cores in almost real time. It was really cool. Uh, is it possible to look for areas of less geothermal heating as well? Do these reasons just not map onto ice sheets or glaciers nicely? from Matthew, that's a great point. Really would like to avoid places with less geothermal heating. As far as I understand the field, it seems like there's a background level of geothermal heating of like 50 milliwatts per square meter all over the place. And what they really want to, want to avoid is the, the places where it's extra high. And the places where it's extra high is because there's volcanic activity or the crust is very thin or something like that, something to do with the, you know, the structure of the, the earth beneath so yes in a way it's the converse of your question it's they try to avoid the places which are high and i'm not and i know for a fact that it's very unconstrained it's very poorly known the geothermal uh, heating as a as a how it varies in space because it's very hard to measure you need to drill down and drill a core uh, a borehole down into the rock and, and install temperature sensors all the way up to actually to actually measure it accurately and that's very expensive do you take horizontal ice cores and what would be the benefits? Fantastic. Answer the question. Most places, it would not be any benefit at all because the snow at the surface is all the same age because it's all getting laid down together. But in some places, that's not true. And they're called blue ice areas. And that's where the ice is flowing down and it's, it's flowing across towards the ocean. But on the way towards the ocean, 
it gets deflected upwards because of a mountain range or something. And at that point, it reaches, it outcrops, we call it, at the surface. And you get these areas where old ice is being brought up to the surface. And people have taken horizontal ice cores. Now, the massive benefit of that is much cheaper. You can do it with a chainsaw instead of a drill, right? You just take, you basically make a trough. I mean, I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but they really are just making a trough and then taking samples along it. So that's much cheaper. The negative side is it's not so much like the situation I described before where the layers are gently going down and being well behaved because the layers have been flowing along a long distance for maybe up to a million years and they've become distorted. And that as they outcrop at the surface, it's, um, it's very hard to date exactly where they exactly Sorry, it's very hard to exactly date the layers. So it's a compromise, much cheaper to do, but maybe harder to interpret than the nice, well-behaved uh, version over at the, in the middle of the ice sheet. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, is it the same way that butter takes shape if you leave it out in a dish at room temperature? It kind of looks like it slides down the sides and gathers at the bottom. It's basically exactly the same as that. And butter is a really good example because butter, doesn't just slide, uh, doesn't just deform. If you put syrup on a table or maybe on a chopping board and tipped it up, it would deform like ice does. It, it's actually called shearing, the ice deforms. What ice also does is it slides along the rock. And I think that's what butter would do more so. Butter is a little bit more, it's, it's more slippery and more viscous, whereas syrup is very sticky and less viscous. So ice does both. But, Sorry, to finish that thought, butter would, when you tip it up, would actually slide along because the base of it would become um, slippery and it would move as a unit. And that's what ice does as well. In both, in, in many places, it's doing both at the same time. So yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, do earthquakes impact the glacier flow or the ice? Um, I am not entirely sure if earthquakes have ever been recorded to affect the ice. The other way around is, is something which we see. So people who record earthquakes at Lamont have been doing it for years and years with this global network of seismometers. At some point they discovered this other kind of earthquake, which was much slower. And rather than, and I think it was that the, it was a more of a slow rumble. The frequencies were much lower. And they were intrigued by this. And it ended up that they traced these back to these huge glaciers in Greenland. And what was going on was these big icebergs were carving off the front and falling into the ocean. And as they, um, as they interacted with the ice sheet above it, like bashed against it, and also as water rushed into the area which the iceberg created as it toppled over, that was generating lots of seismic energy and basically shaking the earth and they were picking that up in the global seismic, seismic network. And now they're called ice quakes. So people who study earthquakes suddenly got interested in those and, and that's a big area of research for some people at Lamont as well. How are we doing for time? Should I just keep going, Cassie? Or? Yeah, I think we can okay. get the next couple of questions, yeah. Okay, Matthew, this is, this is a good point. This is a subtlety, right? So why is the heat flow through the ice necessarily equal to the geothermal heating? Well, at any one instant, it isn't necessarily equal. Imagine that you, and you, could, you don't need to think about ice sheets, you can think about um, something smaller and more in your house, you know, something small, like you put a pan of water on a hob, right? So you stick your pan of water on a hob, instantaneously, that the, the, the heat flow through the system is not equal everywhere. But first of all, you have lots of heat going into the water and the top surface of the water is still cool. So there's not, you're not getting burnt by that, you know, but by putting your hand in the surface of the water initially. And that's the same, if you suddenly turned on geothermal heating, the ice sheet wouldn't suddenly have the same heat flow throughout it. But in what we call a steady state, when everything has stopped changing, and which is off, which we can, assume that the ice sheet is in, in terms of this particular parameter, the temperature. In that case, then the temperature must be equal, sorry, the heat flow must be equal throughout the ice. Otherwise, imagine there was one sliver of ice halfway up the ice sheet. If there was more heat flow into it from the bottom than there was out, from, out of it at the top of this little layer, 
well, then that layer will be warming up and it wouldn't be in a steady state. Temperature would be changing over time. So what you need in every spot throughout the ice, you need the same amount of heat coming in as, the, as, as it is going out. And if you do that all the way through the ice and at the base where it touches the rock, it kind of, you can just logically look through it, think through it and you realize that the, the geothermal heat flux must be the, the amount that heat, of heat which is um, escaping through every layer. And so, yeah, there's more I can say about that. But it's, it's one, other way, one other thing to say is that imagine if it wasn't. Imagine if there was less heat going through the ice than there was coming up against it. Well, then the ice would warm up and it would warm up until there was, as there was enough heat going out through the ice sheet. It's one of these things in the Earth system or in physics, which is stable. If it's not obeying this thing, it soon will be because of the tendency of it to evolve towards that state. But it's a good question. And it's, it's, it's under, a simple thing. Under, uh, underlying it is a lot of fundamental things about how things work. So I'm happy to talk about that more. Uh, the top question is the relationship to the ice core CO2 and the CO2 in the atmosphere the same over time. I can talk about one aspect of that is and, I, and the answer is no, exact, not exactly, because the surface of the ice sheet changes over time a little bit, because there is this region in the surface of the ice sheet where the snow is falling, as, as fluffy light snow, and it's being compacted down to ice over some time. And that could be hundreds of years or thousands of years. And during the time in which the ice, during the time in which the air is in that fluffy snow, as it's gradually being buried, it can undergo this thing called fractionation which is some changes in the, the isotopes within that air because, it's, because heavier isotopes tend to settle down. So that, and, and, and as that snow, uh, that light fluffy snow layer changes over time, that can affect how, that can affect the climate record and how, how closely it resembles the atmosphere. Now, other factors to do with specifically CO2, I can't exactly answer that, but there are definitely people at Lamont who could, who could answer you more, more, more clearly. Oh, so can, can, can any value be obtained from the melted water under the ice, such as chemical content and correlation to climate? In Greenland, people do go to the edge of ice sheets and measure the water coming out. Now, that's, and, and they look at the chemistry of that water. And then the reason they do that is because they want to know how often they want to know how long the water has spent at the base of the ice sheet before it emerged. And that's something which interestingly changes over time. Like during the summer, very efficient river networks develop. So the water gets whisked through that system very quickly and it doesn't spend much time in contact with the rock. But in the winter, when there's not much water going in from the top, it slows down and the drainage system contracts. And they can tell that from the chemistry. So it's things like that which are people are trying to get. And I think the effect of climate directly on the water chemistry is smaller than those other interesting effects to do with how long the water's been at the base. So that would make your suggestion quite tricky. It would be difficult to actually get climate information from that water. But people do make those measurements and it's usually for other reasons. And I think we have one last question from Matthew. Um, yeah. we'll tackle that and then we can wrap up. Yeah, exactly right. The ice is trying to reach a, th a th thermal equilibrium. The warmer it is, the more heat it loses. The cooler it is, the more heat it gains. So really that's, it's trying to be a certain temperature. And this is why we end up with saying heat flow everywhere since the war ice, warmer ice at the bottom is trying to give its thermal energy to the, yeah. Exactly right. The whole thing ends up in a dynamic equilibrium. So at a certain depth, it's a constant temperature, but it's not doesn't mean that heat isn't moving through that surface. Heat's coming up and going out. So in that way, it's a dynamic thermal equilibrium. Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for that. Cool. I think you've got uh, you've got more questions. So um, we yeah, Johnny, up to you if you want to. 
our viewers, if you want to stick around for, for the questions um, and if you want to choose one to, to answer or answer both together. Yeah. That's fine, yeah. YT's question. Uh, geothermal heating, it changes in time, but probably very slowly in comparison to how ice sheets change. It changes in time because um, the circulation of rock in the mantle changes, like, but that's really, really slow probably changes in time because the thickness of the crust changes as well. You know, tectonic plates are moving around and thinning the crust or thickening the crust. So geoth geothermal heating would be affected by that. Um, we can measure it and we measure it by drilling a borehole down and measuring temperature at many locations, then applying that equation, which we just looked at, that minus K times delta T over delta Z. If you measure delta T, or if you measure T and Z and you know what K is, you can work out G. So that's what they do there. Is the earth warm core warming? I think it's cooling down over time, but slowly. But it's it's that that's that heat left over from when it formed, cooling down, supplemented by radioactive decay in the crust. So I think it's slowing down slower than it would do otherwise. How does the viscosity of the water and chemical content vary from Antarctica and Greenland? The viscosity of the water, I have no idea if it varies significantly between the two locations. I don't think it does. I think they are fundamentally the water coming out of the ice sheets at the edges is going to be very similar in the two cases. The chemical content in Antarctica might be different because it's spent more time in contact with the rock because Greenland is smaller than Antarctica. Viscosity of the ice is probably different because Antarctica is generally colder. And the viscosity of ice is very dependent on temperature. So uh, again, that's something we, uh, we're we interested in in our research. So thanks for that good question. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for taking the time to, to answer great questions. Thanks to our viewers for really great questions. Always, always fantastic to see. Um, we will be sharing the recording from the session along with the resources that Rosalba shared. Um, and we'll share that either by tomorrow or Monday at the latest. Uh, Johnny, is there anything else you'd like to add on before we, we wrap up? No? No, no, thanks for sharing. Thanks for being excited about this. And again, if you're a person thinking about what to do next, doing physics or chemistry or some fundamental science and moving into geosciences later is a, uh, is a good way to do it and they you know they pay you to do this actually this is actually a job so this is an option for anybody out there who's interested in it for sure and also um a great example of the application of those fundamental sciences to really important uh things for the world uh so thank you johnny again for your time um in doing this and no worries. yeah for our viewers everybody have a great uh, rest of your day thank you bye-bye Bye.